And we've been doing this series called, hopefully you've been enjoying it. We were talking about it in our group this week, in my small group, about last week's message. We were talking about our call to ministry. Every single one of us has been given spiritual gifts by God and we're called to use them to build each other up and to reach the world. And I was actually quite shocked. I'm trying to figure out if any of my small group people are here tonight. Anyway, I was quite shocked to learn that some of them didn't know what their spiritual gifts were. And they serve and they're great people, um, but they didn't, they didn't have an awareness of necessarily how God had graced them with that sort of the touch of His Spirit. And I thought, man, why we sort of all determined, like, let's make this the last week. We don't know what our spiritual gifts are for those that don't know, because life's too short. And how sad to go through your life not knowing how God has graced your life and being active in it. And so I wanna encourage you from last week to make sure if you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, find out, and I'm sure the team will tell us later on one of the ways you can find out more about that. Tonight, we're talking about probably the, the thing I'm most excited to talk about in this whole series is probably where I began thinking about the series, and it's our calling to work. We are called to work. And uh, the questions I really began with are what does God have to do with work? And what does work have to do with God? When I first became a Christian, I invited Jesus into my heart. I confessed my sin, I repented, and I decided to become a follower of Jesus. His Spirit filled me. I had a lot of catching up to do. I was uh, in my late teenage years. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know about all this stuff. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I thought when I leave school, I'm gonna go to Bible college and catch up on all the Sunday school I missed. Because I would be in church and somebody would be preaching. I wouldn't know what they're talking about. I wouldn't know where the book in the Bible was. I wouldn't know any of the context. I was lost and I, I wanted to learn more about it. That was part of it. The other part of it was like, if this is really the good news, the salvation of the world, God's big story, I was like, why would I want to be an accountant? Or why would I want to, uh, you know, no offence, Nairi, uh, you know, why would I want to be a builder? Why would I want to, and it's nothing wrong with these things. This is sort of the mindset I had as a teenager. I was like, why would I want to do any, I just picked on Nairi and Peter all in one there. Um, why, why would I want to do all of these things? If, if like Jesus is the thing, I just want to give Him my whole life. And I assume that giving him my whole life meant going to Bible college or maybe working in a church or something like that. And sometimes this is the sort of mindset we can have. And because I had this mindset when I finished Bible college, it wasn't a job going in the church. We just started serving in the church and I'd give up a day a week and then I would work actually in construction. And, and I had this one day a week that I would love because I felt like I was doing what I was made to do and uh, I was involved in God's work. And then I had the other days that I didn't love as much. Uh, I didn't love at all. In fact, most days I hated it. And because I couldn't see how this was a part of God's thing. And so it created these like two worlds for me. And over the years, as I was working part-time in church and part-time in, in all sorts of different jobs, I felt this tension because I felt like if I had to give God my whole life, I had to be like working for Him all of the time. And I didn't understand God and work. And I think many of us can feel like that. Many of us can feel like, well, what's the idea with this? Is work a punishment? <laughs> you know, is work part of the fallen world? Aren't we just supposed to rest in God? Is, is work like, or like do I have to, to, to truly be like a faithful Christian or a hardcore Christian? Do I have to like sell everything and be a missionary? Or do I have to serve in church more days a week? Or like, is that what it means to be a, a, a true Christian? Or maybe it's like, maybe we go, oh no, it's not that, but I need to go to work. And being a Christian in the workplace is about converting my workmates. And if we feel like, if we've reduced it to that, probably most days we feel like failures. We're not getting enough conversions this week. That's a lot of pressure to go to work with. So then we, we dial it down a bit. Maybe being a Christian in the workplace is just about living with integrity, doing a good job, being honest, you know, being generous, doing what you say you would do, being a good example to people. So if somebody asks about your faith, they're not going to really, but just in case somebody asks, then at least I've set a good example. When they figure out why I never talk about what I do on Sunday mornings or Sunday evenings, they'll start putting it all together, you know? 
And I think these sort of ideas show that for many of us, we haven't quite wrestled with it. It hasn't quite, the penny hasn't dropped. It hasn't quite clicked. We don't, we probably know that works probably good, but we don't know why and how and how it all fits together. And works certainly, certainly not less than, you know, working with integrity and being a great employer or employer or employee. It's certainly not less than that. It's not less than wanting to see our workmates come to know Jesus, the lover of their souls and find eternal salvation. It's not less than that, but I want you to see that it's so much more. It's so much more tonight. I I hope that God has something to do with our work lives because second to sleeping is probably the next biggest activity we'll ever engage in in our lives. So I hope God has something to do with it. Otherwise, we're gonna live these very fragmented lives. Oh yeah, God's in church, yeah, yeah, sure. God's in my nice walk up the mount or whatever the sort of place you find it easy to experience. And when I read my Bible when I pray, yeah, yeah, God's there. But then I just, I get about the rest of my day and I feel guilty that I didn't remember Him. And then I try to remember Him again and rinse and repeat, wondering what God has to do with my everyday life. I think even our whole world's idea of work, like we, work's sort of a dirty word in some ways because if you really look at the definition of success in our society, is really about how quickly you don't need to work anymore. Like if you're highly successful in life, you get to retire early and well done because you got to escape out of work quickly. You got off early you know, or you die early or something, you know, it's like you escaped it somehow. These are sort of these mindsets that we have around it, but hopefully tonight we discover some new things about work. Work's so good. We're called to work. Even though the word vocation, which we would use to understand our calling into work, means to be called. Vocation means to be called to do something. Listen to just some scriptures about work. Proverbs 12, 11, a hard worker has plenty of food but a person who chases fantasies has no sense. As a parent of teenage kids, I keep trying to tell them they're not gonna become professional gamers (laughs) and they need to work hard. Proverbs 14, 23, work brings profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. Ephesians 4, 28, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work and then give generously to others in need. And I love this. If you're looking for a prayer to pray at the start of your week before you head into your work week, Psalm 90 verse 17, let the favour of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. God cares about work. And even though you know, the work landscape's always changing, even though maybe back in the day people had one career and these days they might have four or five, even though we might re- work remotely, we might have one job and a side hustle and the whole thing's all changing, it doesn't mean God's not in it. And hopefully we can see tonight that when we look at God's big story, work is such a big part of it. And let's find a way to connect it all together. Just a, a few thoughts. The first is this, God is a worker. God is a worker. It starts in Genesis chapter two and it's telling us in chapter one all about his work. And in chapter two, verse one, it says, so the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. So he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. God is pictured in the first moments of Scripture. It's like if you've, you don't have much to go off, but you get that he's creative and he's a worker. He's at work. God's not found in the start of Scripture resting. He's, in the, he's found in the start of Scripture working. And the Scriptures say that we are actually, as human beings, made in his image. We're supposed to not only, there's not only qualities about us that reflect Him, but we are actually supposed to live in such a way that reflects our God. 
In ancient times and even in modern times, if you go to communist countries, a ruler would get a statue made of themselves, heaps of them, and they'd spread them throughout all the territories that they govern, that they rule, that they reign as image bearers, as reminders of who's in charge around here. If you've ever been to a Turkish takeaway place, you've probably seen a photo of the president of Turkey. Right, just like there's this loyalty, there's this, this is the image bearer, we're Turkish, this is our, our ruler. This is, we are supposed to be image bearers of this creative worker God. So if he's a worker, we wouldn't be surprised that we are also made to work. God's a worker. Work is a privilege, not a punishment. I think maybe we feel like it's a punishment because as a kid, when you're getting given chores, it always feels like a punish. And so it sets in this thing from an early age sometimes. But Genesis 2 verse 15 says this, the Lord God placed man in the garden of Eden to tend it and to watch over it. To tend it, the Hebrew word, the original word is to work it, to take care of it, to have something to do that would be productive and creative and protective in this garden. Work is not the devil's idea. Although it can feel like that some days, it's God's idea. Work is part of the original plan, not the fallen world reaction. And work is not something to be escaped in retirement, but something to be embraced as part of the identity of a follower of God. And God's plan, we've been reading out of Genesis chapter two here, God's plan was always for this garden, this garden of Eden, to not stay a garden forever, but to become a garden city. When you read the account of the garden in Genesis chapter two, you read about all sorts of things. You read about how there's, uh, there's four rivers that flow from it. You read about how God's presence is there and He walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the afternoon, in the evening, and they walk together and they enjoy His presence. It's pictured as a place where God rules from. It's got trees, it's got sustenance, it's got beauty, it's got the tree of life. We hear after the fall that actually it's access is guarded and the cherubim are guarding its entranceway. There's all of these things going on in the Garden of Eden, but the Garden of Eden was never God's end game. It was just His beginning game. Sometimes in life we get this idea that it's like, oh no, I j we need to return to Eden. No, Eden was the starting place, not the ending place. The Garden City is the ending place. Let's listen to the picture that was at the beginning of Scripture, at the very end of Scripture in, Genesis, in Revelation 21, and hear all the symmetry between the Garden of Eden and this Garden City. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. If you're wondering why that is, the sea's like a picture of chaos or the realm of evil in the Scriptures. And I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem, all the surfers got disappointed. Anyway, and the, and the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a, sh a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death, nor sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Anyone else looking forward to that day? We could do with dwelling on eternity a little more. And one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making all things new. Verse 22, it says, I saw no temple in the city for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city and the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light and the kings of this world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of day because there is no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honour into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the book of life. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, 
and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything for the throne of God and the Lamb will be there and His servants will worship Him. And they will see His face and then His name will be written on their foreheads and there will be no night and there will be no need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. We might have come from Eden, but we're heading towards the garden city. And there's a temptation in us where sometimes we can want to just return to Eden rather than to go forth to the garden city. It happens amongst people. They get to a certain age or to a certain pressure or stress level and the goals change to how can I escape the city, escape the stress, get a block of land, become self-sufficient, start growing my own things, get a sustainable home. I don't have to pay those power companies. The goals of life change. Sometimes the pressures get so much that rather than wanting to figure out how to do it better, we wanna run away from it and run back to a type of Eden. But the picture of the future is not, you know, the garden and grass skirts. The picture of the future is the sophisticated, beautiful city of God with all of the images of Eden, all of the the river, the tree of life, God's presence, the main street, it's got the kings and the commerce and the glory of the nations being brought into it. It's, It's this beautiful picture of going forward and what God did when He created Eden and He placed us in it is He started a project of which we have a part as workers. And it was never supposed to stay like that. We were supposed to partner with God and we're supposed to develop sophistication. We're supposed to develop infrastructure. We were supposed to design beautiful things and write beautiful symphonies. And we were supposed to paint beautiful works of art and we were supposed to create and we were supposed to teach and we were supposed to raise our families and we were supposed to enjoy it and we were supposed to city build and plan and build some sewer pipes and get some refrigerators in this thing and we're supposed to develop in our medical research and in our doctoring and our nursing and our education and all of this stuff so that Eden would become this garden city with God as its ruler. And God has never abandoned this project. Even though through the fall and through sin, work changed in its nature, became a little bit more of an uphill battle. Now there's thorns in the work. Now there's resistance to the fruitfulness of the work. And we all know that in our work. There's a resistance that wasn't there before, but the project's the same. And through Jesus, through His coming to earth, through His perfect life, through His death on the cross, through His burial and resurrection, we are being invited back into the story. We're being invited back in to the project. Adam and Eve were friends of God walking in the garden. And Romans 5 says that through Jesus and faith, we too can become friends with God and walk with Him in Project Garden City all over again. And this is exactly what our work is about. It might take place in different spaces. There's certainly like some jobs that probably aren't part of the project, like maybe like prostitution. Um, So not all work, and there's maybe some jobs that might need some reflection with God about whether or not Christians should be doing that type of work. But by and large, the careers that most people find themselves in are a part of this project and can be a part of bringing God's rule and reign because God is not coming to replace the work, He's coming to complete the work. He's not coming to go, oh, good try, but let's just wipe that away. And start again, he's coming to finish what he's already doing with us right now. And so there's all sorts of ways that we might, you know, be involved in it, but it all has the same end goal. What is that? God's rule and reign would come so that people would flourish. People flourish under God's rule and reign. It's not a rule of terror. It's not a reign of oppression. It's a rule and reign of what? the Hebrews called 
Shalom. Shalom. It's more than a greeting. It's more than a farewell. It means peace. It means harmony. It means wholeness. It means prosperity. It means flourishing. It means welfare. It means tranquility. And I don't know if you've ever had a moment in your life where shalom has broken in. Have you had even just a split second where you're just like, shalom. I don't know, I can think of different times. Like maybe just every now and then I might be sitting on the beach and the family's there and the kids have stopped bickering for a moment. (laughs) And I'm looking out at the water, I'm under the warm sun and I'm there with my wife and family and I don't know, the stress of everyday life has just dissipated for a moment. And just for a moment, it's like, this is pretty good. Shalom. Just where everything feels right. Maybe it's after like a family meal or some friends and you've been laughing those belly laughs and you've been crying and you've been connecting and you, you finish, you just take a moment to sit back and the chaos of the meals still going on, you take it and just go, there's something so right about the world right now. Shalom. Maybe it's helping somebody and you've been there in their hour of need and you've known that it's, it's, it's made a significant impact and it's brought some peace and some healing and you're just like, oh my goodness, I was in the right place at the right time and God worked through me. Shalom. And it can break, it can, maybe it's a job well done. You finish building this house you've been working on for two years and you take a moment and you step back and you look at it and, and you just, Wow. Shalom. And it can break through in all these different ways, but the idea is is that God wants it to constantly break out all over the place. Jesus' prayer that he taught us to pray, Father, would your kingdom come and would your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is about would shalom come so that people would flourish wherever that happens. And through our work, we get the opportunity to partner with Him in bringing His rule and reign to wherever we work. And we might find ourselves in all different institutions. You know, God has appointed different institutions in this world for different purposes to bring about this flourishing, to bring about this shalom, to work under His rule and reign. He, one of the first institutions we see is the institution of family. It says it's not good that man's alone and family is created and family is an institution that God's created that we find ourselves working in in different seasons for some people in, in our lives and it is work and it's an institution that God has appointed so that children might be raised and there might be a sense of belonging for us in our lives. This place of safety, this place of nurturing in our lives. That's the institution of family and we might find ourselves working in that in one shape or another. Then there's the institution of church. A a few people, we've got an amazing team here in this church and all across the church, but the church is an institution with a particular purpose, a part to play in human flourishing. And that's that to promote worship, to see the Lord worshiped, to see the gospel preached and to see disciples raised up. Then you've got government, I know it can be like a little bit poo-poo government, but we have to think more about government because it's elections next year and I'm not having any of the stupid tribalism next year. So we're gonna be harmonious as Christians. Disagree, but harmonious, okay? Not gonna let political divisions supersede our unity in Christ. And so, but the government is a God institution that He's put and it's to help the other institutions work together well The government's realm is justice and infrastructure. These are parts of what the government does in our country. It's also education, healthcare. These are parts of the government institution. Then there's non-profit organisations. They are institutions. I don't think that God intended. I think that God God needed because of the fall. Because normally non-profits are needed where other institutions fail. Where family fails to be safe, institutions have to step in and help. Where the government fails to make sure that its citizens are provided for, other institutions have to hop hop in and help and so on and so forth. But that's my own little thoughts there. And then you have business. 
as, as an institution in itself. It's like, it's not just greedy, it's not just money, it's not just that. Business essentially exists to ensure that products and services are able to be provided to communities so people can flourish and so there can be meaningful work. Without businesses, because everything that people need to flourish is not located in every community. So without businesses, commerce wouldn't be able to happen where things could get moved all over the world. So the idea would be that everybody's able to flourish if business was operating perfectly. And so this is, and many of us will find ourselves working in our lives, either in family or in government or in church or not for profit or probably for most people in business. And what I want you to know is whenever we're working in one of these places, that this is a part of God's plan. These are institutions that God has commissioned on this earth to play particular roles that when you put it all together, it helps the garden become the garden city. Whether it's in health science or whether it's in education, whether it's in commerce, whether it's in marketing, whether it's in any of these things, engineering, uh, doctoring, you know, these sorts of things. It's part of this project where we can actually bring shalom. We can bring God's rule and reign to wherever we go. And I think this is good news because it means when we enter work, we don't have to invite God into our work. God is already there because work was his idea. When you go to work tomorrow, or you go to your classroom tomorrow, you don't have to go, God, would you come? Be like, God, I know you showed up before me. What are we up to today? What do we got on the cards? What do I need to know? How are you moving in this place? What do you want from me today? God is in our work. If God's in our work, then he's available to help us in our work. We don't have to, please come God and help. No, no, he's already there. Lord, reveal your wisdom to me as I wrestle with this tough decision, as I try to balance out the ethics of profit and people and environment. Guide me, Lord. Lord, as I wrestle with this difficult co-worker, help me, Lord. If God is in work, that, the other cool thing is, is God wants His people to advance in their work, to grow an influence in their work so that He can bring His rule and reign through us. So God cares about your career direction. That means He's gonna wanna open doors for us and He's gonna wanna guide us in the right decisions at the right time. I guess that's why Colossians says this in Colossians 3.22. It says slaves, slaves are really the working class in this time, not to justify it in any way, but it says slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. It makes sense that God would give this instruction no matter who our boss is because work's ultimately his domain. And no matter where we work, we have the opportunity to work for the Lord there. So what? Nice idea, I guess. <laughs> Good thoughts. <laughs> when we are, I know there's lots of young people here. When you're wondering about what I should do with my life, where I should work, what I should train in, what career direction I should go in, we should start by asking what type of institution do we feel called to work in? Is it business? Is it government? Is it nonprofit? Is it family? Like where do we get our sense of, I think this is a good place to begin in our discernment of God, where are you leading and directing me? And then as we get into that, or oh, what part of that, God, how do you uniquely want to bring shalom, your rule and reign through me in this earth through work? And since many of you have many career decisions in front of you in your life, what a great way to begin discerning it. For some of you, you feel like you're in the thing that you were made to do, but you're not quite sure how it all connects. I think it's worthy taking time to reflect on what I've said tonight so that the penny drops, so that Monday's filled with purpose. Life is too short and way too long to continue to go to work but not have an idea of how it fits within God's big purposes. 
We're gonna spend way too much time there. It's worth doing the deep work, doing the reflection, discussing it in our groups, buying a few books, meeting with the pastor, wrestling it with, to the ground so that Monday is filled with what God wants Monday filled with, purpose and presence. So I wanna encourage you to wrestle with it. And I wanna encourage you to ask this question too, what does it look like to do the work that you're currently doing, but for the Lord? When Colossians said, do your work unto the Lord, what does that mean for you in your work? Yes, the systems are broken. Yes, everything's not perfect, but God didn't put those as caveats for living faithfully and obedient in it. That He understands we're working within broken and fragmented systems but it doesn't mean we can't bring His presence. We can't live under His rule and reign in those places faithfully. I hope you discuss it in your groups this week. I think one practice would be for us to pray each day, your kingdom come and your will be done. I think if we faithfully did that, Lord, in this classroom that I'm the teacher of, room 13, God, would your kingdom come and would your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Would your shalom come? Would this be a place under your rule and reign? Oh, you don't know the kids I've got in my class. No, I do not. I bet it's horrible. I'm thankful that you're graced for it. But pray your kingdom come and your will be done. As you, as you go to the building site tomorrow, God, amongst the music, amongst the different tradies, amongst all of this, she says, I drive there. God, would your kingdom come and your will be done. And this patch of dirt with this concrete foundation and just a few walls stood up. Would your kingdom come here, Lord? Oh, as I open up my laptop, still in my PJs, ready to work from home. Would your kingdom come? And your will be done through this screen, on Zoom, through my CRM, or whatever we're doing, would it come, Lord, so that your shalom might just break through just at least every now and then, just a little bit more than it would break through if I wasn't here in this place. As I go to the hospital tomorrow, your kingdom come, your will be done. As I go to the office, your kingdom come your will be done. I believe if we are people who pray those prayers daily, God will lead us in our work and we will find shalom breaking through a lot more often. Here's the promise, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What does shepherd mean? My ruler, my provider. He's the one who leads me. And it finishes with this, finishes with surely His goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You know that word goodness? Let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter one. And the Lord created it and He said it was good. His goodness, His tob shall follow me. When we live under His rule and reign, His promise is that His shalom will never be far away. His goodness will never be far away and it will break out through us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank You that You've called us to work. Lord, would we discover the richness in it? Would we freshly discover the purpose and presence that we could experience in that place? Lord, for decisions being made about careers, Lord, would Your Spirit come and give wisdom and guidance? Would You speak and lead, Lord? Lord, for those whose work is not going so well right now, Lord, I pray that a season of fruitfulness would come upon their work, would come upon those businesses represented here, Lord. Lord, I pray for those seeking work at the moment, Lord. I pray You would open the right doors for the right job for them. Lord, for those seeking workers, I pray You would bring them the right people. Lord, let us live our work lives for You. Teach us to do that, Lord. And we pray that your kingdom come and your will be done in every workplace represented in this church. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen.